for me, there'd be a piece showing up as how much of me is wanting to get this out in the open so that it feels better, quote unquote. Yeah, that's me a good also. And yet yeah. there's really maybe not, that may not be a possibility, that may not be the result. And so I think as long as I was getting consultation and supervision and diving into it in my personal therapy, there's a part of me that says, does it really help? Does it really help him? Welcome to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. Hi, I'm Janine Wolf, and I'm your colleague down the hall. I have a passion for helping fellow therapists get the clinical and collegial support we all need to do this work. And wow, it just keeps getting harder every day. I'm the founder and facilitator of the Collab Oasis Clinical Consultation Groups. I have been a social worker for almost 30 years, and I own a successful solo online private practice. More of us than ever are practicing in solo or online practices, and we all need colleagues to process cases with, commiserate with on those really hard days, and also to celebrate our successes with. In this podcast, I'll bring you insights about trends and changes in our field and sit down with amazing therapists who are doing amazing work. We'll discuss fictionalized cases, ways to practice sustainably, and of course, there will be plenty of laughing. I love laughing with friends. I'm so glad to have you as one of my colleagues down the hall. Hello, everyone. You are listening to another episode of the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. I'm your host, Janine Wolf, joined today by a group of colleagues to discuss a fictionalized case. Listen in as we look at various aspects of the case, along with treatment recommendations, areas of concern, and ways to look at those gray areas we often encounter in our field. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start with the case. Howard is a 46-year-old man who has been in weekly therapy for six months. He initially came in needing help with symptoms of depression. As the sessions progressed, Howard revealed that he was grieving the loss of his childhood best friend who died in a tragic car accident a year ago. Upon further discussion of his grief, Howard reveals that the accident was publicized heavily in his hometown where the accident occurred and has created conflict within his community and also within his family who are not giving him as much support as he expected. The therapist decides that having more information about the accident may bring insight and clarity to better assist Howard. Upon looking up the accident, the therapist learns that Howard was the driver in the car accident and he had a blood alcohol level that was double the legal limit. The therapist is taken aback by this information and realizes that looking up the details of the accident has created lots of personal internal conflict, which will likely impair their ability to work with Howard. How should the therapist proceed? Okay, so does anyone have any clarifying questions about this case scenario? Okay, does anyone have any thoughts about the ethics around this to begin with? Not not to slam the therapist because what's done is done, but just to make sure that we are addressing that at some point. Does anyone have any thoughts around the ethics or decision-making about this? I would say... I would be curious to know what the therapist is thinking about this now, since she has that information after looking it up online. Okay. Has she taken any steps? Has she, you know, consulted with another colleague or any of that? Okay. So I have just recently looked up this information. I had that little voice on my shoulder saying, this may not be a good idea, but I also had this idea that maybe real, you know, understanding more aspects of, of what had happened would be helpful. So I've just looked this up and found this out and I have come straight to my consultation group because I realized that I have very complex feelings about um, the fact that he didn't disclose that he was the driver, which our clients don't always tell us everything. And we know that also the fact that he was behaving recklessly. And this has caused the death of his friend. So my conflict is that I feel empathy for him because he's lost his friend and he's, you know, not getting support from his family and his community, but he also caused this situation. And so I have some history in my past related to someone being killed by a drunk driver. So now I'm realizing that there's all kinds of things that this has opened up for me. So I would say if there's any any type of countertransference transference happening that that 
as a clinician, I would refer the case. If I didn't have any history of, you know, substance abuse or where it wasn't hitting home for me, I would Mm -hmm. talk with the client about that information and finding out about the information and say, you know, I know it's really hard at times to share all the details. I'm sure this is really painful for you, but I know I've experienced that I've had clients that I've worked with for two and three years that haven't haven't shared trauma experiences until they've built that relationship. Right. So the client was not in a place to feel comfortable to share that. I don't know how the legal, if that impacts any legal components or anything, that's the only part that I don't really know about. But as far as for me as a clinician, just really, yeah, checking in with myself to see where I am and what I'm thinking, talk to colleagues and, or a supervisor to help make that decision and then just document it. Okay. My concern is that I've been working with Howard Weekly for six months, so we have developed quite a strong rapport. I do care about him, as we often do with our clients. We care about their well-being, and I'm trying to decide if I can manage to separate the countertransference because of the potential harm of referring him out after he has, you know, he's been slowly sharing more and more information. And I'm worried that he'll never trust another therapist. And, and it was my mistake, you know, and I, if I was facilitating this, I would be saying, but Janine, we are all humans. (laughs) Sometimes this stuff happens. Like, you know, it's a mistake. You recognize that, but we have to move forward and figure out like how to work with the case and work on some self-compassion that as humans, we do sometimes experience this curiosity that impacts our decision-making. One of my questions is how long ago did he disclose this? And then also how long ago did you look up the information And then have you seen, I know that you talked about some of the feelings, but do you see that coming up for you in the sessions? Okay. So I haven't seen him again since that. So we've been working together for about six months and it's only been, it's probably been the last two months that he really started, it just was more seemed like generalized grief about the loss of a friend, but then the details about it was a car accident. So he's slowly been revealing more and more information to me. So at the, after the last session, I actually did a Google search for his hometown, found the information, and I haven't seen him again because I'm a, and I have an, um, another session with him in a few days, and I'm a little freaked out about <laughs> how I'm going to do during that session. And do I disclose to him that I looked up this information? Because now I also am privy to information he doesn't know I am. And do I risk saying something that would let him know that I've looked at us up and is it better to, you know, obviously I just have to address it, whether I refer out or not, I have to figure out how to get through this next session. You know, I would just say it's, it's really a hard situation and gosh, so what is, what is your gut feeling telling you? Like what, what gives you peace as you're thinking about this, like which way to, which direction or what Mm -hmm. you should do? Yeah, I, you know, I'm feeling like my obligation is to try to make this work with Howard, just to maybe do some work to see if I can separate my countertransference and maybe do some work with my own therapist or with some colleagues around that where I can vent my own personal feelings and get support about my feelings and see if I can be as objective as possible. I do work a lot with grief. So I understand and and complex grief. This is obviously very complex grief. So it is an area of specialty of mine. So I'm my, my desire is to see if I can move through it with this case, but I'm also feeling like I need to tell him that I looked it up and I'm really terrified about what that's going to look like in session. So what, what are other people's thoughts about referring out? Beth feels like I I should refer out and maybe I should. It's, you know, it's complicated because I, um, well, it's complicated because of choices that I made are now complicating the case. And I want to make sure there's no harm that's going to come to this client from my actions. Does anyone else have any thoughts about referring out or not? I'm kind of torn on that as well, because I think that it could be something that can help you grow as a clinician, as long as you're Mm -hmm. doing your own work. But I also know that, you know, to your point earlier, we are humans and our stuff can come up for us while we're supporting other people. And it's kind of like, a you'll only know once you get there, like right now Mm -hmm. it feels big because it just happened and you're not really sure which direction to go. But 
potentially with appropriate guidance and consultation and doing your own emotional work to work through your own grief that might present a learning opportunity and like help you grow individually. Absolutely. Those are great points. And, and I have to just also sort of validate that most of us feel very insecure about decisions around referring out because we're not given really great training around that. I was in grad school in the 90s and we were very much taught to be a blank slate and I don't get to show up as a person. I just have to meet the client's needs. And fortunately, I don't think that's the generalized thinking anymore in our field <laughs> um, because, because it's really impossible. Like we just, we just can't always be a blank slate. There are times that we can be blank slates, but not in general. So I guess I'm, I'm a little bit confused about one of the things that you referred to Janine was that there was a mistake on the clinicians on your part. Can you, can you clarify what your, because you looked up the article or you found out about the, about what happened through the me news media or what can you, sh can you expand on that? Cause I'm a little confused. Yeah. So my, mis my rule is always that I don't research clients. I don't look on their social media. Um, I've had clients that have asked me to, you know, read articles that are written about them, but unless they actually provide it to me, I don't do that because I feel like I want to function with the information that's been provided to me. Right. And um, so I feel like I broke my rule by, by Googling this and he hasn't, okay. he hasn't shared with me yeah. that it was a drunk driving accident and that he was the driver. And I'm sure there's a lot of shame around that for him. Yeah. Um, and, and how will he feel now? I feel obligated to let him know. I know this. And how is he going to feel about that? And there is this little part of me that's like, okay, is this unethical? Like, could he file a board complaint? You yeah, know, yeah. like, could this be a bigger issue, which there's the potential that it could. So it feels like there's huge ramifications for me about making this stupid decision. So the other thing that, that comes to mind for me, because I, I totally agree with you in Googling our clients, that, that totally makes sense. One of the things that I guess I'm just wondering about the community that you're providing services in because a lot of times are these kind of articles do you get on the front page of the paper or our neighbors start talking about them or you're at the grocery store and somebody shares hey so and this happened is so and so and this yeah. is how this is what happened you know like they went to high school mm -hmm. together and this is the situation and so that's another component I think just to think about is that you could I don't know why I'm saying that, but I guess I could say. No, you, no, you're exactly right, Beth. And I totally agree with that. And I've had scenarios where in my town, there was a really big public thing and I saw a client and then the next day saw another client and realized that there, I couldn't yeah. work with both of them because yeah. of the scenario. Yeah. And so, but this happened in his hometown, not where I'm located. So I literally okay. would not have known this if I hadn't looked it up. Got it. Um, okay. And typically, it, like if it was local, like that other situation that was local, like part of the conversation was, you know, this has been in the news. Everyone knows about Got this. It, right. You know, I, I typically will own that if it's something that I'm going to know more details than what they're telling me. They probably know that anyway, but I just like to be make sure we're on the same page that yeah. I'm aware of this prior to you coming in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that makes sense. And so the, the piece that is being emphasized is for you or that's standing out for you is the, is Googling it. Got it. Okay. But now I have information that was not shared with me that is going to, it's going to change the therapeutic Absolutely. relationship. Yeah. So, so, you know, what I'm looking at here is loss of trust on his part, potential anger, my own emotions, my values, and just not knowing how he's going to re react. He could feel relieved that now the cat's out of the bag and I know this thing, you know, and then we can move forward. He could be really angry because he didn't want me to know that because that's a part of himself that he's not ready to start working on yet. Like there's a huge shame component there, guilt that he wasn't ready to start working on. He needed, he needed just some support for his own grief initially. I had a question that keeps kind of coming up for me. Okay. What is like the clinical benefit or like pros and cons in disclosing to the client that, Hey, I, I Googled this. I found this information, this humanness, you know, yeah. got me too. 
like what's the clinical benefit in disclosing this to the client? Like, how does that help the client? Yeah, that's a great question because I sort of was looking at it from the perspective of what if I slip and mention something that I know from the news that he hasn't shared with me and would it be more detrimental for that situation to happen? And he accidentally finds out that I Googled him versus me coming forward and saying, look, I did something that I wish that I had not done. Um, and I need to let you know, so we can figure out how to move forward. Yeah. I also wonder if there's, you know, for me, there'd be a piece showing up as how much of me is wanting to get this out in the open so that it feels better, quote unquote. Uh, yeah. For that's me a good also. And yet yeah. there's really maybe not, that may not be a possibility. That may not be the result. And so I think as long as I was getting consultation and supervision and diving into it in my personal therapy, there's a part of me that says, does it really help? Does it really help him? Right. That's an excellent point. Uh, And certainly part of this dilemma of, you know, whether or not I need to disclose this to him. Mm -hmm. I think, I feel like Janine, I'm on the same page as you, is that I try to be as authentic and transparent as possible. And I feel like it would be really hard for me to be able to have that information and not share it and not be able to be fully present and fully um, there to help support my client if they didn't know that I knew that information. I mean, I just feel like that for me, it's kind of like an ethical thing of being able to be open and honest and Mm -hmm. say, Hey, I messed up. I made a mistake, you know, and I just feel like as a clinician, we're the instrument. Right. And so like it it could come out in nonverbals or a way of like that you're judging that you don't realize is coming out in your face or your body language Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. something like that. And that's, I think that's what I would have a hard time with. And one would want, that's what I would want to help get supervision and consultation around is how, how to do that, like communicate that to him. I think to Beth's point also about being an instrument, it's an opportunity for you to model what it's like to recover in relationships and practice like transparency and honesty and owning your, owning your intention and the impact. Because for a lot of our clients, like that is a really uncomfortable space of like having to be vulnerable and apologize. I mean, it took six months for that to come out. And so that means that there's a level of fear or shame or barrier or walls that are still up. And so if you're able to model, like, this is how, you know, when you mess up, this is how you can recover, no matter if you are in a partnership, a romantic relationship, a sibling or a therapist and client, it's okay to acknowledge that you mess up and this is how you can fix it. That's a great point. Thank you, Kalisha. Yeah. And if I was in the facilitator role, I would also be saying you probably need to contact your liability insurance company to get some guidance around this because there is a potential there could be a board complaint and possibly your the, you know, the ethics committee of your governing body, seeing if you are, you know, if you can get an ethics consult around that. Yeah. So I wonder with that being said, Janine, you know, would it be worthwhile to look at the ethics component and even talking to your um, malpractice insurance company? And then you have more information to weigh. I mean, even though we want to be genuine and honest with our clients, but that's, it's really, it's, it's quite a dilemma, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's something that wouldn't be made lightly. You'd really have to really think through and Right. Yeah. All, all the mm-hmm. resources. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think to your point, Maria, <laughs> that recognizing that, okay, I have this session in two days. I don't have to do something right now. I can take some time, show up at that session, do the work that we've been doing, be careful of how I'm interacting and the things that I'm sharing in that session or the way I'm showing up in that session, but allow myself that time to get the consultation I need to get some direction, some clarity Mm -hmm. and figure out how to move forward without harm. And I know that I often will feel like I have to know the answer right now in these kinds of situations. And part of that is because I know I'm not going to sleep for days (laughs) over this. I'm going to toss and turn and try to figure out what to do, which is what happens in the gray areas of our work. So for me, there is a desire to figure this out more quickly, but I think it is probably wiser to take the time to do the things, to, to gather all the information, to make the best 
choice moving forward. Does anyone see any other potential issues here with either disclosing or not disclosing to the client? You know, I would be curious. The thing is, you know, this is based on what you Googled and it was probably from a national or a reliable newspaper, but there might be some, you know, aspects of the case that weren't mm -hmm. included. So right. you have certain information, but not may not be all the information. Might it might make a difference. Yeah. That's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Even even with reputable news sources, there are times that a, an opinion is decided upon and that sort of colors the way the reporting is done. We'd like to believe that the news is objective, but just like therapists, I'm sure reporters as humans will sometimes have their own thoughts about something that they're reporting on. And so it very much could have affected the way that the, the perspective of how this was being presented. In the yeah, I mean, one thought I had, you know, it's possible he could have gotten in an accident. It could have been the other person's fault and maybe he did nothing wrong, but he, he was above the legal limit. So that looks bad. I mean, so it yeah. could there's it's yeah. hard to know really what the full story is. Right. Yeah. And he, he was the driver, but yeah, exactly. You know, maybe someone swerved in front of him. It, there could be other aspects of this that we don't know, but at the same time, he was doing something that most people would consider reckless and it cost somebody their life. In terms of like the benefits, I'm curious, like in the, the write-up that you have, it says that the goal of this was to bring insight and clarity to better assist Howard. So I'm curious, like, did that, even with all of your feelings, was there anything in that information that you did find helpful that maybe like you did explore or maybe it's about in terms of like building the case a little bit better and understanding his, his side a bit better? Yeah, I love that question, Kalisha. Yes. So it answers the question of why this seemed like such complicated grief to me and why there were these these tones of shame that I didn't understand. So now I do understand them. So from that perspective, if I can move forward with Howard, that is going to help me support him better. You know, and just like the mistake I made, he made a mistake, right? And showing him some empathy and compassion that, okay, you've had whatever consequence the law has given you. And that's separate from what you're dealing with interpersonally. And my job is to help you work through that. So yes, it did accomplish some of that, but in a very complicated way. <laughs> I'm also curious, you know, the intent, if your intent was to, provide you more information so you could provide better therapy. That I think makes a big difference too. Right. So yeah. do you, I'm curious, what was your intent when you looked at <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> that's a great question because I am struggling with trying to figure out what my intention really was or what I want to believe my intention was. Was I really just being curious um, and wanting to know and it got the best of me or was I truly trying to help this client? It, you know, after the fact, it's kind of hard to decide because now that I know that I feel like I made this mistake, I want to believe that it was altruistic in my actions. But uh, there's that little voice inside of me that says, no, girl, you were just being nosy. <laughs> you know? and, and I think that's another complicating factor because then it's it's challenging me to look at my own values and and how I could have trampled on my values in such a way that it's created this conflict for me because my values were very strong around that before. And, and I feel certain that I will never do it again. <laughs> um, but now it is what it is. Now I've made this decision. And I think all of us either ourselves as therapists or know another therapist that has done something that they realized was not the best thing to do. And now they've got to recover from it and, and not harm anybody in the process. Okay. This, so this has been interesting. And, and much like all of these types of cases, there is no right answer. I feel confident that my liability insurance company is not going to give me real clarity. They're hopefully going to give me some direction as far as minimizing damage. But anyway, about it, this is, it, it's done. I have to work through this. My hope is that my experience with clients is that when I have to discuss something difficult with a client, I really struggle and worry and think about my wording and my phrasing and really 
are, I'm really afraid of what the conversation is going to be. And it typically a difficult conversation is not anywhere near this. It's something like maybe referring out a client or changing your work hours. So they're going to have to change their appointment time. But what I've learned over the years is that most of the time, the clients are very gracious and flexible and they do fine, but this is different. <laughs> and I have no idea how this is going to get handled. And so it feels very scary for me. So I would ask, this is a very, you know, I'm sure this type of thing is going to happen to all of us during our career. Something's going to happen that's really uncomfortable, but yes, I would just ask or suggest, you know, are you doing more self-care? You know, are you doing all Mm -hmm. those things to kind of keep yourself in a good place of peace? Thank you, Maria. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I need to do that. Part, Part of my issue is that I feel guilty about what I did. And I almost feel like I don't deserve to have this discomfort relief, but I hear what you're saying. And I appreciate you validating that because it is, you're right. You know, it's this, this work that we do is not based on, you know, any type of objective criteria, really. There's so much subjectivity in our work and we do show up as humans and we're not trained to how, how to be a human and a therapist. So these things happen and and they're difficult. All right. Well, if anyone just going to pause for a minute, see if anyone has any other thoughts or questions or concerns. Okay. Well, I appreciate I that one, everyone. Oh, thing. yes, yes, yes. Something please. that you said at the end kind of made me think, and you were saying that you, as the therapist, you kind of felt like you know, you didn't deserve to have any relief from this. And so it kind of got me wondering, like, is that also how you feel about Howard? Like, is that something that's complicating your experience with him? And if so, that's something that you would have to work out with like your own therapist and supervision as well. Absolutely. Such a great point. Yes. Because as I said, I have the, this own, my own personal experience and seeing somebody suffering as the result of somebody killed by a drunk driver. And so that part of me that I worry about is I do want to help this man. We've de- developed a therapeutic relationship that's important and I care about his well being. But I do worry is there a part of me that's going to not be able to fully? provide empathy to him and help him seek relief because maybe in the back of my mind, subconsciously, I do feel like he should be suffering more. So that is another area that I would need to be concerned about. Kalisha, thank you. Another question, another question that I was thinking of is, and again, it's just kind of like, we're just talking like brainstorming, like absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But, but finding out like what, what after, if you decide to share the information, with him about what you found out talking to him about what what do you want the next steps to be would you be comfortable working with me do you want me to help you find another clinician like helping you know like being like hey I really messed up I'm I made a mistake um you know like taking accountability for it but then also giving some agency to him to be able to check in with himself to be like, Hey, I really would like to continue working with you. I appreciate you sharing that with me or heck no, I'm getting out of here. I want to go find another therapist or, but being able to provide that space for him to give feedback and make decisions for himself too. So he has that like empowerment piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a great point, Beth. And, and that's so, so shifting my focus to, it's not all about me and my decision-making, but that this is a therapeutic, <clears throat> therapeutic relationship. And I need to acknowledge his role in choosing how we're going to move forward as well. And so expanding my thinking a little bit more beyond just feeling my own guilt about my mistake, but recognizing that I made a mistake that's now impacting another person and they do have agency in, in how this is going to proceed as well. Yep. And, you know, piggybacking, I think Kalisha touched on this earlier, but also giving him the opportunity and saying something that along the lines of, this is a very hard situation, but if we could work through this, you know, this would be really wonderful, you know, practice as far as resolving a conflict with someone and to help, you know, him moving forward in relationships or even, you know, trying to, re- to improve relationships in his community or with his family around this issue. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, again, I appreciate the thoughtful comments, um, the way people interacted around this, clarifying questions, also supporting and affirming that 
I did something that I regret, but I'm a human. We do those things. This work is complicated. So I appreciate everyone showing up in that way today so that, you know, I've seen so many scenarios where a therapist was reaching out for help and they were shamed or guilted about their actions or their decisions, and that doesn't accomplish anything. So I love that we can model here today how people can do this collaboratively and supportively, not saying like, oh, don't worry about it. You're fine. No one's absolving me, but they're saying, okay, you did it. We get it. Let's figure out what the next steps are instead of going on and on and on about why I shouldn't have done what I did, which wouldn't help anybody (laughs) at all. So for everyone listening, there are new episodes of the Colleague Down the Hall podcast released every Thursday on all major platforms. Please remember our work is hard, but it doesn't have to be lonely. Thank you so much for listening to the Colleague Down the Hall podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to colleaguedownthehall.com where you'll be able to learn more about getting the clinical support you need and resources to help you work in a supported, sustainable way. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your therapy friends and colleagues. Subscribe to the podcast. And if you love this episode, please leave a review.